Hello and welcome to Viewpoint. I'm Volivar Solohub. Join me now in our studio to talk about separatism, security in Europe, and trade relations between Ukraine and Spain is the ambassador of the Kingdom of Spain to Ukraine, His Excellency Gerardo Bugallo Tone. Mr. Ambassador, welcome to Viewpoint. Thank you very much. Mr. Yeah, Ambassador, you. in the last two years, uh, Ukraine um, became more and more uh, similar to Spain. Uh, Ukraine uh, has faced separatism, mm -hmm. something which uh, Spain has been facing for many years. So uh, these, these similarities, um, how, do you, how do you cope with the separatism in Spain? Well, let me put, I think in, in your question there is sort of a trap that you fall into it. Because I don't think we have a problem of separatism, neither in Spain nor in Ukraine. Here, what you have, and I have been asked this question very often, what are the lessons you can extract from the Spanish transition in your political transition? And I tend to say that not very many, because our situation, our point, point of departure, was very, very different. Uh, Spain under Franco was no doubt a dictatorship, but was not a corrupt country. The society was basically healthy, the economic tissue was healthy, and the transition was rather easy in the sense that it was just a political transition, but the economic uh, and social development of society was already there. As opposed to what happened here. I think in Ukraine we have a very big problem that is corruption, and that is your main fight. On top of this problem that is endemic to the inheritance of communism, you have some imposed problems from abroad, that is this so-called separatism that I don't think is endemic from Ukraine. It's something that has somehow been artificially created by different interests. And it is not very dissimilar to what happened in Spain. Uh, if you look at the history of Spain, there is not this tension of separatism, as you could call it, but there are instrumental elements that use some political uh, agendas in their own favor, eliciting and creating and fostering a sense of separatism that is never majority, is never the majority of any part of Spain that wants this, but is in the interest of certain groups. And you can follow this very closely when you see what happened with the manipulation of education and television in certain parts of Spain. That creates or tries to create a sense of separatism that this has never been authentic, and it's not, it's not authentic I, 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 even now with all the, this, uh, this, let's say, this uh, unbiased, or, or let, let me see, this completely uh, unbalanced representation of reality in some parts of Spain. Well, talking about um, uh, creating the image and uh, communicating certain messages, uh, the information campaign, uh, or as some of them call the information war, has been huge Absolutely. In, in, in Ukraine. Um, how crucial or how instrumental is this information campaign uh, with regards to the separatism, both in Ukraine and in Spain? Well, as I was saying before, it's, it's absolutely the key, the key element of the whole thing, because we are, we are talking about the world of perceptions. And when you manipulate the perception, there was a Spanish philosopher Ortega said that used to say that reality is a matter of perspective. So when you change the when you alter the perspective, you alter reality. And this is exactly what is happening in, 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 in Ukraine, obviously, and to a certain extent in parts of Spain. But let me put, uh, put it very clearly. You know that we, have, we are facing this huge amount of uh, Russian propaganda against Ukraine. With most of them plain lies, we call the, the government here fascist. Everybody that approaches uh, Ukraine realizes that it's basically a bunch of lies. But you, you have to take into consideration, especially in a, in a television like this, that the main obstacle for truth is not a lie, but is confusion. So what many people try to achieve with these kind of campaigns is just to create confusion, to get people to think that everything is mushy, you are not sure what is, what is right and what is wrong. And it is the big success of the propaganda war, to create confusion, much, confusion much more than to create the idea that you are right when you are telling a lie. 
Well, talking about this uh, propaganda and um, um, information wars, um, the, the, the Russian propaganda machine has been trying to use the example of the European separatist movement as uh, something which um, Ukraine should follow and Ukraine should allow to do the same. For example, when there was the um, referendum in Scotland, hmm. uh, you had uh, people, and this, this already all started in, 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 in the Donbass region in Ukraine, you had people in, on the streets of Donetsk where with uh, placards saying that they are supporting the separatists in, uh, in, in, in Scotland. Do you see the influence of Russian propaganda or Russian manipulation with respect to the separatism movements in Spain? Not really, frankly. I think they try to use, as, as you were pointing out, you try to use these, these tensions in their own favour, but the influence of, of uh, Russian propaganda in this is, is completely negligible because, again, there are no the basic needs, the, I mean, the basic realities to support a movement like that. So you cannot invent them. You can try to manipulate reality, as I said, but you cannot do very much from well, Russia. A lot of experts, a lot of experts say that uh, Russia's main goal right now is to break up the EU, to split the EU. They are financing, they are financing the right-wing parties all across Europe uh, so why don't they finance the or support the separatist movements? Absolutely, no, no. One thing is what do they could try to do, and I think is what they can achieve. Let me put it, it, this very clearly. I think the biggest success of the Russian propaganda, and this is very important to understand, is to what an extent they have been able to give the impression in the West, sometimes even among some of our leaders, the Western leaders, of the power of Russia. I remember, I, I, keep, I kept repeating for months and months that the Russian economy, at the height of its power, the oil, when the oil prices were skyrocketing, was not bigger than the size of Italy. A year ago, it was smaller than the economy of Spain. I let it to you to, 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 to figure out where they are now. With this kind of reality, they are projecting an image of superpower that is not true. And the worst, the worst part of this is that that creates a huge problem for Russia itself, because it, they are repeating basically the same problems of the Soviet Union, the, the same mistakes of the Soviet Union, and getting as a result the same problems the, the, the Soviet Union faced. And I think this is something that is, we have to understand very clearly. I remember Dmitry Trenin, the, the head of the Carnegie Endowment in Moscow, once said that to understand what is going on in this part of the world, you have to realize that Russia, or the Russian direction, the Russian political, uh, the Kremlin, if you want, doesn't, hasn't, has not understood that in the 21st century, the power of attraction is much stronger than the power of coercion. If you put this into perspective and realize what Russia could, ha uh, could, uh, uh, could have achieved in Ukraine through peaceful means, through cooperation, through a common area of prosperity, helping Ukraine instead of trying to boycott what the Ukrainians want to do. It would be extremely helpful for Ukraine, but extremely helpful for Russia also. Another question is the political agenda, the, the, the inner politics in, 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 in the Kremlin. But if you look at the real interest of Russia, the stability of Russia that we cherish, I think it's very important a stable Russia. But how to achieve it? That's a big question. Mr. Ambassador, some experts mm -hmm. say that Russia poses a great threat to the security and peace on the entire European continent because of uh, this hybrid war which Russia is involved in in, in eastern Ukraine. Do you agree with that? And do, what do you think the international community should do to stop or prevent this threat? Well, again, uh, it, is, it is true that you can consider the threat in the terms of military pressure or whatever you want. But again, I, I come back to what I was saying before. I think the biggest uh, menace for Europe in the medium and long term is the destabilization of Russia through the ways they are following now. As I said, they are repeating the same mistakes of the Soviet Union and you just look at what is happening in Russia. I mean, they want and they, they are able through the propaganda to project this idea of a superpower, but it's a very fragile superpower. So I remember that uh, um, A.J.P. Taylor, a famous uh, British historian, used to say he was referring to Hitler in the Second World War, but the, the sentence is, is the, the quotation is valid in any case, that if you keep sitting ground, yielding, in front of somebody that is much weaker than you, you are setting a trap for him. I think, to a certain extent, what the Western world has done with Putin in the case of Ukraine 
has been a little bit in, al along this path. If you, keep, if you have a monstrosity like the occupation of Crimea and the reaction is mild or is, is slow, then you give the other guy the impression that he's much stronger than he is. So, in your opinion, what should the international community do about Russia? Well, it is pretty obvious. Basically, what we are doing to, to keep a straight line, to keep a very clear position about what is feasible and not feasible, what is acceptable and not acceptable, what is international law and how international law ca cannot be tinkered with, and follow that path until the proper conditions are settled, are, are, are established. But it doesn't seem to be working. Russia continues violating international law. Russia continues resisting the sanctions which are being applied. Well, as you said, it, it, this is a process. You said continuing to do it. So if they continue to resist, we have to continue the pressure. It's as simple as that. What uh, people, some people would think that we would need more pressure. Some people would like, I'm sure of that, to relieve that pressure on Russia. For me, the intelligent way to approach it is not make this a sort of pro-Ukrainian or pro-Russian, but to understand that the best way to be pro-Russian is to help Russia be stable. And the, the way they are following is the perfect way to destabilization of Russia, not to stable to a stable Russia. Yeah, some interesting thoughts here, Mr. Ambassador. Many thanks for finding the time to come and talk to us and join us in our studio. We were discussing the Spanish-Ukraine relations and cooperation opportunities with the Ambassador of the Kingdom of Spain to Ukraine, His Excellency Gerardo Bojayo Tone. I'm Vladimir Solohub. Thank you for watching Viewpoint. Right, thank you very much.